something to believe in. I thought I had life figured out before I started puberty. Every word they told me in church was the truth, and so was every word my parents told me. For obeying my parents was the most important law for a child. I got enrolled in a Catholic school, where I remained until I was a teen. I knew that it was clean cut, that there were people who were good and those who were bad. Father Malik would preach nearly every Sunday about the sinners, and the things that they did, like not listening to their parents, and stealing among other things. And then he would preach about love and the different kinds, which was when one Sunday after church, at the age of 11, I saw two men holding hands and kissing. I pointed and said to my mother, are they in love mama? And she hit my hand and told me never to speak of such things again. So, love between a man and a man was wrong. Lesson learned mom. As I grew older, I immersed myself in my faith, but I also got curious. Some of my friends used to speak of drinking liquor and the way it felt. In hushed whispers, I heard that some were experimenting with sex. Needless to say, I got immersed in some of those things. I tried cigarettes and liquor, even though I felt bad afterward. I knew that I was most likely being a hypocrite, and at confession, I said my Hail Marys. But that did not take away the strange yearning I felt from indulging in those things. When I was 17 years old, I knew of sex, drugs, and alcohol. I had never done the first, I felt that I was too committed to my faith. I did not see girls in that way and was more comfortable around boys which I thought was me being safe from lust. So, when Ian suggested that we go to his cousin's house party, I was a bit suspicious, and I knew my parents would never let me. His cousin went to the other school, the public school across town that my parents loathed, but I had been having arguments with them lately and was getting tired of them controlling my life. I was now a frequent user of alcohol and would sneak some into my room often. I found it made my mother's whining about the neighbors tolerable, and my siblings' noise fade into nothing. Will there be alcohol? I asked the most important question. Of course, Ian said. I never got why sin felt so good. Two nights later, I sneaked out of my room and no one heard me, for they were heavy sleepers. I ran to the end of the street and there I saw Ian and Trevor in Ian's car. We drove to the party, and I could not help the knot in my stomach. I nearly told him to turn around, but I was in too deep now, and would never risk being called chicken. The party was in full swing when we arrived. We got some drinks and just stayed in a corner because we did not know anyone. Then, some girls approached us, and the boys exchanged wolfish grins before talking to them. I talked to a girl called Samantha, who had a habit of giggling and saying OMG every three seconds. Naturally, my eyes wandered around for something more stimulating to my senses than cheerleading. My friends always said I was handsome and could easily get girls, they said I was a prude. I did not care. And then, I saw him. I felt a spike in my heart, one I have never felt before. He was across the room, laughing and talking with a small group. I could figure out why I was drawn to that particular human being, but I believed it had something to do with the band t-shirt he was wearing that was identical to mine. A few seconds later, he met my gaze and nodded to me. I quickly looked away. The party was in full swing now. But I was bored, so I walked around the house and looked at the pictures on the walls. This was when someone said to me, If I had known that I was going to have a twin here tonight, I would have brought two caps. What? I looked beside me and saw the guy from earlier. He gestured to his cap which was part of the band's merch. And that was how, at a random party, I had an unforgettable night. We ditched the drunk teens and went to stand by the balcony. And we remained for what seemed like hours. People came and tried to whisk him away but he would easily dismiss them without taking his eyes off me. The conversation got deeper as I downed drink after drink. I was far from wasted, but in a state where I could entertain the thoughts in my head, like how I felt when he touched me and the sudden urge to do things that I had only seen in videos my friends sent to the group. I suddenly got a text in the middle of our conversation. Trevor, hey, where are you? We need you on our team for beer pong. Me, I made a new friend. Trevor, well then, enjoy. Trevor, is that your boyfriend? Jesse, my new friend asked, how did you see my screen? I asked, your phone is titled, and I can read upside down. He looked at me like I was silly. What makes you think I am that sort of person? I asked, getting defensive. He held up his hands. Sorry dude, just an assumption. Are you? I did not know how to feel. I had a deep connection with him, and it did not raise alarms when he said, yes, I am gay. Wait, you were with the Catholic school kids, right? He asked, yeah. But anyway, you were telling me about. I found myself changing the topic. About 30 minutes later, I found myself in a room alone with him and leaning in to kiss him. When I did, I kept on wanting more and tugging at his hair. This stranger had done to me what girls had failed to do for many years, and it felt so good to give in to the unknown. 
I felt like I wanted to pull away and do more at the same time and it was maddening. Eric, a female said. She had a phone in front of her and she looked like she was taking a video. One of the girls in the next grade, Gloria, and the person with the biggest mouth in the whole school. I could barely make out what she said before she disappeared into the crowd. Something told me to run after her, but I did not have the strength. I was suddenly sober now and I realized the sin I had just committed. I heard Jesse call after me while I ran to ask Ian to take me home. Seeing my panic state, he did not ask any questions and got Trevor then we drove home. They talked about all they had gotten up to that night but all I could think about was burying myself beneath a mass of pillows, which was exactly what I needed. That night, I dreamt of Jesse and only of Jesse, his lips on mine and the desire that had awoken, like a ghost determined to haunt me. I could not rid myself of him for the rest of the weekend. Shit hit the fan on Monday morning when my dad told me not to even bother going to school. I asked why then the room grew icy cold when he showed me his phone and a short clip of me kissing Jesse. Where did you get this? I checked my phone and saw that I had so many unread messages and tags. It was always on silent, and I only checked it a few times a day. If I had bothered to check it a few hours earlier, I would have seen that I had been exposed. Drinking, sneaking out, and kissing a boy. My father shunned my very name and refused to speak to me. All my mom could say was that she was ruined. Her only son was gay and a sinner. I could not take it anymore and went to my room. I cannot think of a time when I was more heartbroken than that day. I read each and every message damning me to the pits of hell. Everyone ending their friendship with me and some parents telling me to stay away from their children. Then, there were the slurs and messages to kill myself. And all I could think of was why it was so wrong for me to act on the connection I felt with Jesse. No female had ever made me feel like that and now I knew that it was because I was gay. I got the scolding, the grounding, and the nail in the coffin. The suspension from school. All I could think about was if I would ever see Jesse again. The next few weeks were hell and I turned further away from my family and who I was. I had repressed the memories, but now I could remember my dad getting mad at me for not liking manly things and crushing on male TV characters and brushing it off as adoration. For days, I stayed in my room, consumed by self-doubt. My siblings would bring me food, and Ian and Trevor stopped by several times, but I did not want to see them. Father Malik came and prayed for the demon within me to leave my body, but I found that I did not believe in his prayers anymore. A few days later, my fate was sealed, and I went to stay with my super-religious grandparents. Every morning, I would wake up and help my grandpa around the house, and then my grandmother would drill Bible verses into me. But all I could think about was when she would catch her afternoon nap and I would be able to see Jesse again. When I saw him the first day I arrived there, I was freaked out and thought he had followed me. But he later explained that he was visiting his dad the night we met. He stayed with his mom in my grandparents' town. My grandfather started coming toward me. So I quickly skirted off, but not before Jesse slipped his number into my hands. Who was that? My grandfather could not see that well even though he wore glasses. Postman, I said. Who? I must keep an eye on you, especially when it comes to men. Oh what has this world come to? I was very confused and there were moments when I loathed myself and wondered how I had deviated, and why everything I had been taught was not really the truth. I called him that night when the old people were asleep, and I explained what I was doing there. He was very understanding and gave me support without once bashing my religion. And so then, in the afternoon, when my grandparents took naps, I would sneak off to his house. He would always have snacks and drinks for us, and we would talk for about two hours before I had to go. He helped to answer most of my questions about sexuality, and made me feel better about myself. I feel like everything I have been taught is so wrong. I do not know who I am even more, I said to him one afternoon. I cannot speak for you, but it is a slippery slope when you have been religious all your life, he said. I have no place in the church, I said. It does not mean you are a bad person, he said. But I have no one to believe in, I said. Find something to believe in. If you fail then believe in yourself. You can still practice the good values you were taught, and still love who you want, he told me. What he said made so much sense to me than those scriptures my grandmother had me memorizing. I stopped feeling so bitter toward the world and focused on being free. And with Jesse, I could be free. We could talk about anything, even if it was a taboo topic. I had to unlearn some things that restricted me. But once I freed my mind, I saw that there was so much more for me out there, and that my connection with Jesse was not just one of friendship. His mother knew me by name in a few days, and she never raised an eyebrow when she walked in on our conversations. I liked how transparent they were with each other. I never had that with my parents. Anything shameful was to be kept hidden. With Jesse, he made me laugh, challenged my mind, 
and caused me to have butterflies with the way he sometimes flirted with me. I became more confident around him with every day that passed. On some afternoons, we would be silent, listen to music, and just cuddle. Being in his arms felt so natural. It never went further than that though. He was very respectful of me and my journey. He told me stories of his childhood, his first and only love, and how it ended. While I told him of my years hiding who I am, in those whispered secrets, it felt just like the exchanging of souls. One night, I went out with him to a local concert. My grandparents were at an overnight prayer, and I had put on a very convincing show, so they were convinced that I was sick. The band that had brought us together was playing, which he did not tell me. We danced the night away and I wished that it would never end. What I felt was untainted euphoria and I wanted more of it. Even when we were sitting in his room later, I was still buzzing. Thank you so much, I said. What for? He asked. For pulling me out of the dark, I said. Leaning into him and doing what I had been wanting to do for days. It had been brewing between us, the chemistry that seemed to cackle. I spent the night in his room and snuck out the next morning. We started dating right under my grandparents' noses. They thought they were somehow getting through to me, but boy were they wrong. It was a whirlwind. But not always, sometimes we would savor the moment, as we fell for each other. I dreaded the day I would be forced to return, and feared discovery. But he told me to stop worrying, as it would cause my heart to fail, and he would be left without my love and I told him to stop being corny. But I did stop to enjoy the moment. But Murphy's Law is a thing, for I do not know what I was thinking. But I snuck him into my room one night. And there, my grandmother caught us, and she was so pissed off. She woke my grandpa up and they started hurling abuse at us. We have failed. You need to be sent to a conversion center, my grandma said. My heart was beating so fast, and I was getting very scared. Go and call his parents. We cannot keep him here anymore. My granddad had so much disgust in his voice. They both left us standing there. I had two seconds to think. I did not want to go to a conversion camp. I was not broken and I love Jesse. I only had to look at him to know that he was thinking the same thing. I will help you pack. Let's get out of here. And thus I left the cocoon of safety that had been a prison. I was disowned by my family, but I got over it with time. I got several calls and messages from them, threatening to send me to the conversion camp. And guess what my answer was? Remember that I turned 18 while you were grounding me. I have much more rights over myself now. So, leave me alone. Because there are organizations who will fight for my rights, it felt so good to finally speak up against them. They had limited my view of the world and suppressed me for far too long and I was done. I heard the satisfying click and put the phone down. I stayed with Jesse and his mom for some time, then got a job so I could contribute. Jesse and I remained a couple and discovered new things about each other every day. He was the only person who calmed me when every single person in my life turned their backs on me. Ian and Trevor did not hate me but they could not go against their families. They were already in trouble for sneaking out of the house, but I understood. I just hoped that they would be happy. When we had been working for a year, we moved to a small seaside town together. There were few people around, but we rarely faced any hate. We both had decent jobs, and even though it was not much, we were comfortable. Tough times did rock our relationship, but we came out stronger every time. And I knew what I believed in, unconditional love, for everyone no matter their age, gender race, or what they had done in their past. Summary Eric was born Catholic, but as he gets older, he starts to change the path that he is on. He was taught at a very early age that being gay was a sin, which made him avoid gay people. One day, he sneaks out to a party with his friends because he is always fighting with his parents. He meets a boy, Jesse who he is drawn to for some reason. They spend the entire night talking and their connection is almost instant. Since he has been drinking, Eric finds himself entertaining certain thoughts about Jesse. This leads to a drunk kiss that is recorded by Gloria, the girl who gossips the most. She posts the video on social media and his life is ruined. He is Catholic school kicks him out and his parents send him to live with his grandparents. He meets Jesse who is staying with his mom there and he helps him accept himself. The connection is undeniable and they fall in love. His grandparents find out his parents disown him and he moves in with Jesse and his mom. He and Jesse find jobs and end up moving together. The end. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become a part of our Rainbow Force and stay wholesome.